I'm Fonzo. And I'm Aliza. And we're the co-host of Grown, a podcast from the moth that shows we're never fully grown. Growing up feels like a phase that should end at some point, but does it ever really? Whether you're 16 or 26 or 86, you're going to have to deal with family drama, your body, and the type of person you want to be. So why not put it all out in the open and go through it together? Join us every other week to deal with cringe, culture, and the courageous efforts of people like you to get grown. Start listening today. Follow Grown on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. Going out for date night with your man is nice. Driving out on the open road together is great. Watching football together is great. But I I think think women would agree. Getting home to cuddle up with their man is nice, too. It's kind of nice, too. It's nice, too. Viagra helps guys with ED get and keep an erection. And you only take it when you need it. Ask your doctor if your heart is healthy enough for sex. Do not take Viagra if you take nitrates for chest pain. It may cause an unsafe drop in blood pressure. Side effects include headache, flushing, upset stomach. 25 years ago, what we now call the little blue pill became the fastest selling drug in history. It has been described as the new fountain of youth. I have an erection like I was 25 again. It is a pill called Viagra that seems to offer a real cure for impotence. That was the introduction for Nightline on ABC News on April 27th, 1998. The demand for Viagra when it hit the market was huge because up until that point, treatment options for erectile dysfunction were pretty limited. Pfizer, the pharma company behind Viagra, chose the late Senator Bob Dole for their first ever television commercial, in which he admitted that while he was a little embarrassed to talk about his experiences with the ED, he knew how important it was to millions of men and their partners. But what was missing from that message, and much of the public discourse since, is that Viagra is not a cure-all for erectile dysfunction. And framing the conversation that way can lead people to feeling even more alone in their experiences. I knew it wasn't normal and uh, started growing a lot of shame, a lot of guilt. It's something that I didn't want to speak about with uh, family or friends or a medical professional. I was just dealing with my my curved penis and, uh, and the shame that came with it. That's Ven Vera. He's a public speaker and global healthcare staffing professional based in Vancouver. For Ven and so many others, erectile dysfunction is at once something that challenges your physical body, your sexuality, and perhaps most importantly, your relationship with yourself. This is Embodied. I'm Anita Rao. Erectile dysfunction, by definition, is the inability to develop or maintain an erection for satisfactory sexual activity. ED can be caused both by physical and psychological factors. And while it's more likely to occur with age, it's not exclusive to older folks. Venn started noticing a physical curvature in his penis when he was in his late teens, something he attributes to years playing soccer goalie, sans jockstrap. Did I have erections? Yes. Did it hurt? Yes. It was hard for me to to assess how were my erections versus other men at the time because I was really not talking about it. And that became the reality I was living in, in my head, for 10 years of my life. The curvature and the physical, emotional, and mental aches that came along with it made sex and intimacy a real challenge. And some of the comments Ven heard left their own scars. Once initially, somebody did find out. She wasn't mean or anything, but she was pretty much telling me that Well, it's not going to go in. It's not going to work. So we can't have sex. We can't have penetration. Um, And and, uh, that struck with me. And it was really hard for me to experience. From that point on, I was just very much subconsciously just breaking every relationship I was with when it got a bit more uh, intimate. So you mentioned that there was this really long period, 10 years, where you didn't talk to anyone. And there are so many resources online about erectile dysfunction that stress, no matter the discomfort you're feeling, talk to your doctor. But I know that for so many people, that first step of actually being able to say something out loud is so, so challenging. It took you 10 years. What was it that pushed you to finally be able to open up to a medical professional? What led to me making a decision and moving forward was I did this personal transformation course and a lot of 
things that were in my subconscious came to the surface. And it was like, oh my God, I do have a problem. I'm thinking that God's going to take care of it. It's going to heal on its own. But the reality is I have the tools and the responsibility to deal with what I'm facing and I need to do something about it. Van worked alongside his doctor for months, experimenting with a range of ED treatment options. The physician was actually so interested in his condition that he offered to fold Van into some of his research, which allowed him access to treatments that wouldn't have been covered by insurance. But after a lot of trial and error, his doctor said the only option left was surgery to straighten out the curvature in his penis. This was back in 2011, when Van was 28. Ultimately, it was the prospect of surgery that inspired him to finally open up to friends and family. So essentially what happened was I was going for my uh, surgery and I remember um, at that time they were going to be putting me to sleep uh, as part of the surgery. And I remember a few years back, I had lost my cousin who passed away because of um, being put to sleep for a, an easy surgery. And I was like, oh my God, this could be the last time I'm alive uh, by going through this surgery. Nobody knows what I'm going through. And I remember that morning I wrote on Facebook uh, as if this would be my last post, my last status. I'm like, my life is my message. And and I left it to that. And my mom replied, she's like, no, your life is my message. And I ju that just lifted my heart. And I'm like, oh my God, my mom doesn't even know. Mm. But to my luck that morning, the uh, hospital called me and they told me that the doctor that had to do my surgery had an emergency procedure and couldn't take me for my surgery that morning but that we will reschedule in that two months. And in that two months time frame, I took courage to tell um, my sisters, my mom, my dad, my closest friends. And every time I would share the story, I would cry so much. And I wasn't one to cry, but I really had like the floodgates open and I cried and then I shared. And it was so great to see how everybody was so supportive and just were wondering why it took so long to tell them. And then I went into that surgery with the closest people in my life two months later knowing what I was going through. You come from a South Asian family, as do I. And we've talked before, I've talked to my parents on this show, and there's been a lot of acknowledgement that it's not a culture known for talking really openly about personal struggles, about uh, things that are considered really private. I'm curious about any cultural pressure you felt to kind of protect your family's reputation or fears about, you know, what was going to happen if you opened up. So that's a big thing because in the South Asian community, there is a, um, there is a saying saying, uh, what will people think? Uh, and essentially, it's always always like, what is the community going to think? What are they going to say? Um, you know, you don't want to sound weak. You don't want to air our dirty laundry to people. So, uh, yeah, I was trying to protect my family. Um, I felt that asking for help felt weak. Um, many of us were actually conditioned to keep our hidden shame hidden. So you told each of your family members separately in individual conversations. And I'd love to know in particular about your conversation with your dad and how that went, what came up in that conversation for you. So I, I took my dad separately out for a walk and then I just, uh, I told him. And uh, what I really appreciated about my dad is he kind of created a very light environment where he was making it sound like it's not a big deal. This is something people can go through. And that we're here as a family to help you. It felt a lot of relief, Anita, like to be able to tell my dad, like the male figure in my household, about what I was going through as a young man, um, felt like so much weight lifted off my shoulder. While medical interventions for erectile dysfunction like Viagra or curvature straightening surgery are a relatively new phenomenon, the existence of so-called cures for ED or impotence are not. If you were a penis owner with erectile challenges in ancient Rome and Greece, you might have walked around wearing rooster and goat genitalia as talismans, under the assumption that doing so would promote sexual function. If you lived in the 13th century, you might have been instructed to indulge in some roasted wolf penis to promote potency. In the 19th century, French neurologist Dr. Charles Edward Brown Saccard opted for a more invasive approach. 
he injected himself with extracts acquired from dog and guinea pig testicles. So yeah, we have made some progress. One of our more modern inventions is the Vacurect. It's a vacuum erection device that's been in use since 1999. When Australian poet Steve Jones started experiencing ED post-prostate cancer surgery, he turned to the Vacurect to support him in his recovery. And he wrote a poem about that experience. It's Dr. Seuss-like in its rhymes, but serious in its subject matter. My trusty old friend. Still only a half, still only a quarter. Go on, stick it in that plastic transporter. Now grease it up good, silicon ring on the end. Pretty soon he'll be there, my trusty old friend. Oh, just for one night I'd like to be normal. No pump or no needles, roll over, informal. Alas, it is not. I'm so sad it's not so. I hope for one day I'll be all systems go. Your partner's right with you, though out of their league. They try to understand all the care you'll need. So needle it, pump it, stretch it and bend. I'll soon have it back, my trusty old friend. With patience, perseverance, love messages sent. I hope I see you someday, my trusty old friend. For many people experiencing ED, patience and perseverance are critical components of a journey without quick fixes or surefire cures. And moving beyond a diagnosis can be just as much a psychological matter as a physical one. That's where therapy can come into play, to help folks unravel the stories they've told themselves about erectile dysfunction. I often start with talking about language and the power of language. We have this language called dysfunction. And right there, that word can be incredibly destabilizing and uh, stigmatizing for a person, especially if he um, uses that term as a synonym for failure. And so before we even get to the root causes, I encourage the individual to start thinking more broadly and perhaps that this isn't a failure and perhaps we need to listen. And what is your penis trying to tell us? That's Dr. Reese Malone. He's a Winnipeg-based sexologist and sex therapist with a doctorate in human sexuality. And he often works with clients experiencing ED, many of whom come to his office after trying Viagra or Cialis and after wading through the wild west of internet guides to biohack your way to an erection. Well, we also know that there is big money to be made from someone's personal vulnerable experiences. And I, you know, prefer to move into these discussions of the impact really of those messages and the messages that he takes on that impacts his sense of masculinity, that impacts his sense of what it means to be a man, you know, virile and available and sexy, what or how he senses a value in himself and his sexuality. These messages of what it means to be a man are pretty inescapable. And for many folks experiencing ED, they can further contribute to a cycle of stress, shame, and stigma. That's something that Venn encountered after his surgery. So when I uh, was told by my doctor that I could go out there and meet someone and get intimate and that everything should be fine, I met someone. We tried to have sex once. It didn't work. We tried again another time. It didn't work. And at the third time we tried and it didn't work, I got very, very, um, I guess, frustrated or sad. or uh, And I was just feeling a lot of shame because I went through such an ordeal. So I went to the doctor and told him my situation. And that's when he replied. He's like, well, physically you're, you're healed, but you still have 10 years of trauma that you need to address. And um, he referred me to a psychologist. And that took me on a nine-month journey of talking about what it meant to be a man. Reese, there are so many kind of meta narratives around sexuality and at the core of a lot of concerns that people present with. This is something that sex educator Emily Nagoski always talks about is people want to know that they're normal. And it's hard to know if what you're experiencing is normal when it's something that you don't really talk to people about. What are some of the recurring ideas that you hear from folks about what they expect to be normal in terms of sexual function, in terms of erections? 
Yeah, you know, those messages, those cultural messages about what is a normal man and that all penises should be able to, quote unquote, perform on demand, that you can will an erection and that um, when you have an erection that it's it's meant to be 100% hard or hard as if no other uh, factors like aging, medication, injury, all those messages. And so parts of the work is unraveling those messages and that oftentimes men would feel incredibly low about themselves, low self-esteem, feeling that uh, no one will love them, no one will be attracted to them, that their dating life is over, who will marry someone like me? And especially then, if I can't get this uh, treated or cured, um, there's questions about, can I have a family? I- am I desirable? And so it, we've really put in a lot of meaning behind what it means to be hard and not hard. But this also points to uh, how important it is to have comprehensive sexuality education to teach people and to bring awareness that these are how bodies operate. And bodies are not meant to operate 100% of the time. And that's normal. You bring up an interesting point about the dynamics within a relationship when erectile dysfunction is present. And Ven, I want to ask you a little bit about this. You went to therapy, you tried online dating, you matched with someone that you ended up marrying. And I'm curious about how you all talked about and navigated your history of ED in the context of your sexual relationship as a married couple. What I did initially was she didn't even know that I I started dating her. She didn't know I was dealing with erectile dysfunction. But eventually, a few months into us dating, we actually had sex for the first time And uh, she thought I knew what I was doing, but in my head, I'm like, is this going to work? Is this going to be okay? Is this what it's supposed to feel like? And um, I went ahead and it worked and everything was great. And I understood what it was supposed to feel like. So on my last day of my um, therapy session, my therapist asked me, she was like, is there any final wishes that you have? And I told her, yes, I would like to invite my girlfriend to come to our therapy session so we can explain to her the whole journey and the work that we've done, and then she can leave and you and I uh, as a therapist and I can have our closure. And then after that, I met with my girlfriend at the time and uh, we spoke about it and I was like, so what do you think? And she's like, Ven, I am actually so happy you told me and just know that it doesn't change how I think about you, that I'm here to help and support you and uh, happy you told me and that this was your journey and, and that this is what you had to go through. I actually feel it got us closer to each other. So that was um, a very healing journey for me to be able to experience that uh, with a partner. And it actually led us to have a healthy sexual relationship and to be able to to move forward on that path. Then I'm curious about how your communication around ED evolved. You mentioned that moment of clarity and connection with your wife. Uh, you all have since gotten divorced and you are back in the dating world. How do you talk about ED now and, and how does it show up in your sexual relationships? I felt that the more I spoke about it, the more authentic I got in my conversations in general. Uh, the more I've been able to be more in my heart space than my head space with people, which I feel people really appreciate. And the one thing is, when I speak about such topics, I feel that I'm also giving permission to people to open up. I remember a friend telling me, uh, like 20 years later, uh, he was like, wow, if I knew you were going through this in university, I would have had so much I could have shared with you about my own personal experience. But now I feel that I want to be more real about my, my, my life stories, my life experiences, and to not feel that shame or guilt, to really empower myself and empower other people to, to know what it feels like to be human and that they're okay and whatever they're dealing with, I can help them or other people can help them, but there are people and resources out there to help them and it's okay. I do encourage people to give themselves permission to reach out to uh, people that you trust and those conversations can be difficult. And the more that we can uh, lean into that vulnerability, the the better position that we all are uh, culturally and societally to talk about with dignity and respect different aspects of our sexuality and destigmatize talking about sexuality, the better position that we will all be in 
uh, individually, relationally, as well as culturally. Having erectile dysfunction is actually pretty normal. In fact, it's statistically common. Half of all people with penises aged 40 to 70 experience ED to some degree. And while it can be a source of shame and stigma, it doesn't have to be. The first time I had ED, I was 18 years old, and I was trying to have sex for the first time. And uh, it didn't work. I wasn't able to to get it up. It was like having an out-of-body experience. Uh, It was very unnerving, very destabilizing, and um, it was very much like I wasn't in charge of my own body. At 47, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. As an African-American male, it's a common diagnosis. As a result of surgery, I was told that I could have erectile dysfunction, ED, and after, you know, waiting a few months to see if my functioning would come back, it never did. It was pretty devastating. I just wasn't ready for that part of my life to be over. But after time, I realized that it wasn't over. And so I did a lot of writing, a lot of thinking about it, worked with a therapist. And the result of that, I would say, is that I have a much better understanding of my sexuality. And I would sort of view almost ED, its ultimate result in my life is quite positive. Our sex life expanded. We we found that we could slow down and begin to enjoy one another um, in different ways that we may have bypassed. We're learning, we're growing this um, in a new way of uh, connecting with each other, and uh, ED is not the end of it. That was Will Richards and Shannon Munford. Will is a writer and author from Montreal whose inaugural novel, Mother, features a main character who struggles with erectile dysfunction. And Shannon runs a Facebook support group for couples exploring sexual intimacy after prostate cancer treatment. With penetrative sex off the table, many folks experiencing ED are forced to grapple with their own definitions of sexual connection. That was the case for George Marks, a 72-year-old blogger and social activist who started experiencing erectile dysfunction in his 40s. George wrote about his experience in a 2013 article for Voice Mail magazine titled Living and Loving with Erectile Dysfunction. In that essay, he admits that while he was intellectually able to accept his new reality, emotionally, it was a different story. Well, I understood it was a, quote, normal part of being, it still was difficult. And I was transparent with my sexual partners. There was, it wasn't like I hid things, but it still was challenging to have a disconnect from my own body. And it felt like it happened overnight, although it, in a way it didn't. I could have the same experience of being with my partner and feel, wow, I'm really turned on and think that my penis was engorged and was enlarged and it was soft as can be. And there were other times when it was back 20 years ago was somewhat hard and I thought it was soft and it was very disconcerting to feel a disconnect, sort of like like a paralysis almost. George's first experiences of erectile dysfunction were in the 90s and early 2000s, well before anonymous internet forums started to bloom. And his efforts to find support and community were mixed. I looked for other people's writing, and all I found were ads for Viagra or pills or things like that. And the only discussion I found was in a, I think it was a Yahoo group that I connected with. And even there, it was almost all women. And there was one man who was who was deeply involved in it. It was isolating. And uh, I mean, fortunately, it wasn't all of my life. And I never thought it was all of my life. And I wasn't ashamed of myself for it. But I still felt it bothered me. So you experienced these repeated challenges, getting and sustaining an erection. You approached your family practice physician, who then referred you to a urologist who gave you samples of a variety of oral medications to try. And you found that Viagra worked the best with the least side effects. Talk to me about your experience with Viagra. What was that like? How did it affect your experiences of sexual intimacy? 
from the beginning when I used Viagra, it was a mixed blessing at best. And some of it was the instructions and I hadn't followed the instructions, but I discovered I had to do it on an empty stomach. I had to uh, test myself about 30 to 50 minutes after I'd taken the, the Viagra and see if my penis was getting harder. And then if it was hard, then it was like, we got to have intercourse right now, which was totally disconcerting because I was used to trying to please my partner, trying to stimulate her sexually. And I was not into this rush, 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 rush kind of thing. And I didn't view sex as just intercourse, but in the, in these moments and using Viagra, it was like, it was like I was a machine almost. Well, I'm curious about that. I mean, you, you, mentioned kind of the word machine. Did Viagra-induced erections feel different compared to how they'd been before? Yes. And I, it, was, it was hard to understand how they felt. It felt artificial in a way. It felt, it felt sort of like seeing a phallic image as opposed to being my own body in a way. I felt d- disconnected even when I had erection. And also the other thing was that it didn't always work. And and it started to stop working at all. And all of these things made me feel, is it worth it even using the Viagra? And I, and I want to stress that this is a personal thing. It's, it's, it's how it felt with me. I'm, I'm sure other men might feel differently and maybe in similar circumstances. I don't know, because we don't really talk about it that much, if at all. Of course. Yeah. It's a very personalized process for each person. In your circumstances, how did the conversations with your partner go around using Viagra? What was that like? And and are there any kind of memorable ones that stand out to you? Well, my partner tried to be supportive of me and she accepted that I couldn't have an erection, but she would have loved to just be able to have sexual intercourse quickly and go to sleep and just be done. And I couldn't do that. It's not very romantic or very comfortable to plan exactly when you're going to have sex or sexual intercourse and then just have it right then in the moment. So you mentioned that you all decided to take penetrative sex off the table. And um, I'm curious about how you then approached pleasure and sexual intimacy. It wasn't new to you to not focus on penetrative sex. And we talk a lot about kind of redefining sex beyond penetration. But what were the specific things that you started to experiment with and try in that moment once you both had kind of embraced this new reality? Well, I always I always love touch with a partner. And for me, I, I love it from just light kisses, hold, hand holding to rubbing bodies and touching in ways that can be totally non-sexual, they can be sensual, and then they can move into being sexual. And uh, for me, the focus on orgasm and the focus on penetrative sex was never the the goal per se. Sex was, was two things. And for me, a lot of the value of sex with my partner was trying to please her and help her have an orgasm. The only areas that I found really difficult with that were some of the things with strap-on kind of things, I, I was fine with doing those things, but I, when it was painful for me, when it was uncomfortable, on my back, not in a sexual way, but just physically, then I found it really next to impossible. Yeah. But in general, in general, to me, there's a whole variety of touch that it can have. And I also realize what I get pleasure of, that sex is a lot in the head. It's not always in the body itself. It's how it affects my brain. And I feel very lucky in so many ways because I don't feel like some of the masculine messaging I I didn't really get. I mean, we've been talking a lot about erectile dysfunction in the context of intercourse and partnered sexual relationships, but it also shows up in your your relationship with self-pleasure. How has erectile dysfunction shaped your relationship with self-pleasure and masturbation? In that way, I think it's really changed it for the better. And it's helped me cope with the fact that it's getting harder and harder or more, more difficult, more difficult, I should say, to orgasm and to get semi-erect and other things like that. But it's well, some of this has nothing to do with erectile dysfunction with me, but I've been really trying to move out of my head and into my body. And I think as a man, 
it's really important that we listen to our bodies. And as the therapist earlier said, erectile dysfunction can come from physiological things. It can be a warning sign to our body that we have something. And for me, it may have been cholesterol or blood pressure that did it. It may have been warning me, you've got to take care of these issues and we need to listen to our bodies. And I think a lot of the times I, as a young man, learned to overcome my body, to force my body, to push my body. And now I realize I don't want to die from not getting to the doctor in time to be treated. And in order to do that, I have to listen to my body and my sexuality and my penis is part of my body, just like my arms and legs are and my heart and other parts of my body. Folks like George, who are willing to open up about erectile dysfunction, are part of how the conversation around the condition can and will change. As scholar Angus McLaren puts it in his book, Impotence, A Cultural History, Western culture has simultaneously regarded impotence as life's greatest tragedy and life's greatest joke. And George would agree that it is time to rewrite that story. I think we need to heal ourselves and heal our traumas, and we need to really change what masculinity is in general, and I don't think it should be what it has been. I hope that we'll find more in the future as individually and as people, and I think part of this is the dialogue, and I would love to hear from other men. You're looking for community and connection community and connection and allyship and supporting other people in our similarities and our differences. Embodied is a production of North Carolina Public Radio WUNC, a listener-supported station. If you want to lend your support to this podcast, consider a contribution at wunc.org now. You can find more about all of the guests you heard from today in the show notes of this episode. This episode was produced by Gabriella Glick and edited by Kaya Finlay. Paige Miranda also produces for our show, Skylar Chadwick as our intern, and Jenny Lawson is our sound engineer. Amanda Magnus is our regular editor, and Quilla wrote our theme music. Thank you for listening to Embodied, and happy 2024. If you missed last week's episode about self-help, it's a great New Year's listen. And as we kick off this year, we would love to hear from you if there's anything that you want to hear us talk about in the coming months. Find the link to leave us a voicemail in the show notes, or write us a note. We're at embodied at wunc.org. And if you like this show, please spread the word in your own networks. Text this episode to a friend, share about it on social media. Word of mouth recommendations are the best way to support this podcast. Until next time, I'm Anita Rao, taking on the taboo with you.